Welcome back to class, everybody. Anthony Sequera here with StormwindLive.com, and I am thrilled that you are joining us here. We're in, let's see, I got to look down, see where we're at. We're in session number five, aren't we, of eight sessions of our CCNA security course here, otherwise known as IINS. And when we left off last time, we were talking about our good friends, access control lists. So important that we master these access control lists, and it's not just for security purposes. Sure, we've been biased in this particular lesson to utilizing these to act as a static filter, a static firewall type filter in our infrastructure, but that is not the only reason we are going to rely upon access control lists. We might use them in QoS to distinguish a particular type of traffic. We might use them in network management when we want to highlight a particular traffic form. And when we're doing these for any purposes, we typically use the extended access control list. That's because it is so typical that the standard access control list with its ability to merely examine source IP address just doesn't go far enough. Yeah, we want something that's going to be much more robust that can examine a wider variety of criteria. I mean, look at this. When we look at a extended access control list, we can examine protocol, we can examine ports, we can examine destination ports as well. Now notice there is going to be a lot of syntax here that you can utilize when you are creating an extended access control list. As a matter of fact, this isn't even all of it. This is just some of the syntax that we can use. So this is a really good time to use context-sensitive help. Don't be embarrassed if you have to use context-sensitive help frequently when you are creating your extended access control lists. We all tend to do that because of the complexity of this syntax and your desire, your necessity to get it exactly correct when you are building these important structures. Now notice when it comes to us assigning an extended access control list to an interface, nothing at all changes, does it? We use the IP access group syntax, and then of course we're gonna have to use the in or the out keyword in order to indicate directionality for that extended ACL. Well, let me go ahead and jump to the command line and let's take a look at an example of utilizing these extended access control lists. So if we go up to our R1 device, we recall that R1 device had an IP address set up on it of 10, 10, 10, 1. So this is how we should be able to reach the R1 device all the way from that R3 device that we had set up. Let's go over to the R3 device and make sure that connectivity is indeed working. I'll ping 10, 10, 10 dot 1. And perfect, we see that we can indeed ping from the R3 device to the R1 device. Okay, great. Now, let's engage in an extended access control list to do some filtering. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and filter so that R3 cannot do these pings, so that these pings will not succeed. Pings for that specific workstation will be as granular as possible here as we construct our extended access control list. Notice also we'll do this ACL right here on R3, the source of the traffic. 
confirming that best practice that we talked about earlier, and that was we can create extended access control lists very close to the source of traffic because of the granular nature in which they operate. So we'll go to this R3 device. Hey, wake up R3, there we go. And we'll go ahead and configure this device from the terminal. All right, here we go. We'll say access list 100, indicating that we are dealing with an extended access control list. And we'll say that we want to deny ICMP packets. We know that ping utilizes the ICMP protocol, so we're able to filter right down to the specific protocol. And we'll get even more detailed than that in a moment. So we're going to deny ICMP traffic. And we're going to deny it from a source address a specific source address. We'll say from this host at 10.20.20.3. And where is the destination traffic going? Well, the destination traffic is going to be going to host 10.10.10.1. And what specific type of ICMP packets do we want to filter in this particular example? Well, let's do echoes. Let's do pings. So I'll say echo. Awesome. <coughs> Excuse me. So notice how we can be very, very specific in this extended access control list. You'll love it. We're able to filter on the particular source, on the particular destination, on the particular protocol, even down to the particular packet type. We're not going to block all attempts at ICMP communications here from 10, 20, 23 to 10, 10, 10, 1. Not all ICMP will be blocked but instead just those specific ping packets, those echoes that would be sent. Absolutely remarkable, the power of this ACL. Okay, now I'm going to go to the interface here on R3. So I'll say interface fast ethernet 0 slash 0, and I'll go ahead and set this up outbound. So IP access group 100 outbound. Okay. Now, moments ago, we could go ahead and do the ping. And you're about to see something very interesting. So we could do the ping moments ago. Now we have assigned on router 3 an outbound access list very specifically stopping this ping that we're about to do right here. And the ping works. Oh my goodness. What happened? Well, we built this beautifully, but we forgot one of those very important rules when it comes to our access control lists. They don't want to function by default with traffic sourced from the router. Oh, no. And that's exactly what's happening in this case. This 10-20-23 source is coming from R3 itself. So this outbound access list isn't catching that. Oh, wow. And that could be really tricky for you to track down. By the way, something else we did wrong as we created this particular access list, and I want to give a shout out to Carl in our audience who actually picked up on this. Great job, Carl. 
we did not put a permit in. So this access list was wrong and ugly to begin with. It did not permit anything, so it will end up blocking all traffic. Yikes. This could be one of those resume producing events that we speak of and that we try to avoid. Okay, well, let's do this. Uh, first of all, notice the ping still working and we got to prevent this ping. That's our goal. And we want to prevent it as explicitly as possible, as granularly as possible using our extended access control list. So uh, let me get rid of this attempt. I'll just go to the interface and I'll say, uh, yeah, just kidding about that IP access group 100 out. So we'll get rid of that. A great way to confirm that there is no access list assigned to an interface, by the way, is to do show IP interface for your interface. And it says outgoing access list is not set. Inbound access list is not set. So that's a great way to engage in that verification. Okay, now, if we go over to the R2 device in the middle, it seems to me that we'll have more success with this specific filtering here, won't we? Sure. Why don't we go to the device that sits in the middle here, the R2 device, and why don't we go to the interface that faces R3 and why don't we put an access control list inbound that's going to actually do what we want here and prevent this particular traffic flow? Pretty cool. All right, so here we go. We're going to go to this device and we're going to say IP access, and we're not doing a name, so we can just say access list 100, and we're going to do our deny entry. Once again, we're going to deny some ICMP traffic. And folks, I've done millions of these lists, <laughs> sadly enough, close to a million. And notice how I like to use the context sensitive help still to guide me. Don't be embarrassed if you are in that position. No big deal. Okay, so access list 100 deny ICMP. And uh, what's the source going to be? Well, once again, the source of the traffic is going to be that 10.20.20.3. And once again, the destination of the traffic is going to be that host at 10.10.10.1. And once again, it is particularly the echo packet that we want to guard against, that we want to filter. So now we go into the fast ethernet zero slash one interface that faces our three and we think, okay, what direction for access list 100? And this would be perfect inbound. It makes sense inbound to go ahead and stop these particular ping packets. Now we want other traffic to get through. So we're going to go in and we're going to override if you will. Oh, look at this. We just crashed something. We just crashed EIGRP because once again, we forgot a permit any any statement. We're crashing all traffic now, yikes. So let's go into our access list once again and say access list 100 permit and we can say all IP traffic and we can say from anywhere to anywhere. And now we are overriding that implicit deny all and notice this EIGRP relationship is repaired. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, so let's take a look at our access list. Show access list. And it has this deny that we carefully structured to stop the specific ping we were interested in stopping. And then it's got this permit and there's a whole bunch of matches that are hitting that permit 
because there is a bunch of other traffic forms being spoken between these routers, like EIGRP being a great example. So if we hop over here to the R3 device, drum roll please, <laughs> all right, terrible drum roll. If we go ahead and try the ping, it is going to fail. Specifically, R2 says to us, nope, sorry, you can't get there. That is an unreachable destination to you, and that is because the R2 device is killing off those ping echoes as a result of our very sophisticated, ah oh yes, very, very sophisticated access control list. Specifically, it's an extended access control list that is doing that great job. Okay. If we go over to the R2 device and we do our show access list, we should see that, yes, there are matches for this particular entry now that we constructed to stop that ping. Now watch this. Let's go over to R1, uh, excuse me, R3, and let's create a loopback interface for testing purposes. I'm going to go to this loopback interface and give it an IP address of... Uh, 192.168.1.3. Now, I am going to do a ping to 10.10.10.1, but this time I'm going to source it from loopback 100. And this ping works beautifully. Why? Well, because our access control list, our extended access control list, uh, allow, allowed itself by definition to be very specific. We said only drop those ping echoes sourced from 10.20.20.3 going to 101. And now we're going to 10, 10, 10, 1 from 192, 168, 13. And this is allowed by that very specific extended access control list command that we created. Great stuff. Let's look at a example in our text here. Access list 101. And we are going to deny specifically TCP from 172.16.4 to 172.16.3 equal port 21, one of the two ports that can be utilized in the file transfer protocol, FTP. Then we deny TCP 172.16.4 going to 172.16.3 over the other FTP port 20. So in our diagram here, it looks like we are wanting to stop this subnet from utilizing FTP into the 172.16.3 subnet. Then we do our permit IP any any to allow all other traffic, IP traffic. This because of the implicit deny all access list entry that ends this particular list. We then take this and we assign it outbound on the E0 interface. So what have we done? Well, we can see it below. What we've done is we have denied FTP traffic from a particular subnet to a particular subnet out of a particular interface 
And then very important, we have permitted all other traffic with this extended access control list. Now, there is another interesting technique we can do with these extended ACLs. Notice here, there is this option of established that we can add that allows the TCP traffic to pass as long as there has been existing connections. Wow, pretty cool. So here in this particular example that we have on screen, the established parameter of this extended ACL is going to allow responses to traffic that originate from the mail host at 200.112 to return inbound on the serial zero interface. So a match occurs if the TCP datagram has the ACK, the acknowledgement, or reset bits set, which indicates that the packet belongs to an existing connection. Without this established parameter in the ACL, the mail house could receive simple mail transfer protocol traffic, but not send it. So pretty cool. We have this established parameter that will allow traffic to come inbound here from already established connections. A very, very cool feature. And you can see how this would help to prevent denial of service type attacks. The verifications that we did in this particular class together included like show access lists. And one of the things that we love about show access lists is the fact that as we saw in our demonstrations, we can get match indications. We can see just what access control entries are being matched with particular traffic flows. So we get to see effectively the effectiveness of our access control list. To see if one is assigned, we went ahead and used the show IP interface command in order to see the assignment of a particular access control list. When you're doing these static ACL filters, first of all, you want to be careful, don't you? You want to be very, very careful that you are building them correctly. You saw where context-sensitive help really helped us. Write them out on paper. Think about what you want to do. Write it out in plain English on paper and then start doing the conversion to the router's command structure. Make sure you develop a plan for these. Implement them. Test them. Think about what changes need to be made. Have a process for doing all of this. And yeah, test, test, test. You don't want to roll out ACLs that are filters and then have a resume producing event come up and bite you. Things that students tend to forget, the implicit deny all. Yeah, let's watch out for that implicit deny all that could bite you. The implicit deny all, sometimes we have to kind of override it, don't we, with a permit all if our access control list is made up of nothing but deny entries. Remember, standard ACLs kind of lame because it's only based on source IP. Remember, the order of statements is critical. Let me demonstrate this. You do not want to go to a router and do something like this. Access list 101 permit IP any any and then do access list 101 deny ICMP from anywhere to anywhere using echoes. This list is not going to work for you. 
because the IP traffic gets permitted first and it never gets down to this deny check that you were interested in implementing. So there's another trap that we don't want to fall into with our ACLs. Also, remember they are directional in nature. Yeah, they are directional in nature. So always create them, really think about them, and then make sure you're uh, putting them in the correct direction. Remember, we can modify our ACLs. Whether they're numbered or they're named, I demonstrated this, how they're all going to have line numbers now that we can very easily go in and manipulate. We demonstrated that we got to be careful with router generated packets. They are not going to be filtered by the ACLs by default. And we demonstrated extended ACL placement being as close to the source as possible and our standard ACL placement being as close to the destination as possible. Now, we have really focused in at the command line and that's because that is certainly going to be a focus in the real world and it's also going to be a focus for those of you that are interested in the certification environment. But I will say this, the certification environment might also want you to demonstrate a mastery of how you would do access control lists in the graphical user interface that is used by some folks out there. Remember that SDM utility? Well, notice here, to do ACLs, once again, we end up going down to that additional tasks area. It seems like we end up using that so much. And under the additional tasks, we can see there is this nice ACL editor. And under that entry, you see that we can go ahead and select access rules. And over here, there is an add button where we can go ahead and add access lists uh, and their rules in a graphical user interface nature. This is where some of the purists, they just cringe. They're like, oh my goodness, you were using this graphical user interface to build an ACL? That is so cumbersome. That is so clumsy. I could build you an ACL so much more efficiently at the command line. Well, so be it. We do want to cover all ways there are to do these particular tasks. Here I've selected the add button and you see we get the add a rule here. And we add a standard rule in this particular case. So we give it a pretty bad name. We name the access list outbound. That's a pretty bad name because we could get that confused with direction under an interface, couldn't we? It is a standard ACL. And then we're going to add rule entries to this using none other than the add button. We say permit we go ahead and give a particular IP address. Notice we can give a description down here. We can log entries. All of this, of course, available at the command line. This is just giving us this nice graphical user interface way to do it. Next up, we go ahead and we have this rule and we can edit the rule in order to associate it with an interface. Actually, uh, there's an edit button here. Let's be more clear about this. The edit button would be for you to make edits to this if you didn't like it. And then the associate button down here is how we're actually gonna get this screen that allows us to associate this ACL with a particular interface. There's this handy dandy drop down of interfaces and then thank goodness, 
they allow us to specify the inbound or the outbound direction. Now, when you look at this for a standard access control list, it might look really silly, right? Because they're so easy to make, the graphical user interface just, it seems a little silly. But I'll tell you, it's not the case when you look at the extended rule. So once again here, we begin the same. We use the add a rule feature. We give the access control list a name. I don't like their name of inbound, but that's what they did. They go ahead and now say we're going to do an extended rule. Once again, we use the add button and this screen looks a little bit more impressive. Yeah, because this is going to help us build an extended access control list. And here the graphical user interface does appear to be a bit more valuable to us, doesn't it? We do our permit or deny. We do our optional description. We select source, host, or network destination host or network, the particular protocol or service, okay, the particular IP protocol itself. Notice this asterisk here, which gives us more options. So this gets a little more robust. And then obviously, once we're finished building our rules with the graphical user interface, we use the associate button to associate that access control list with a particular interface in a particular direction. So, routing protocol entries could be built with this graphical user interface, where you go in and you permit or deny specific routing protocols to be done. You might use this graphical user interface to create specific IP address spoofing mitigations, denying particular addresses that should never come into your network from an internet address. Now look at these. These are all addresses that should never be a source address coming in on an internet facing interface. Interesting. Now, here, you know, they're implying that you would create these in the graphical user interface environment, but I don't care what you create these in, these anti-spoofing ACL entries, just as long as you create them correctly and you use the directionality correctly. So once again, this is an example of ACLs that would prevent spoofing. All of these addresses should never be the source address coming in on an internet interface. Yeah, the private addresses are in there, the loopback address space is in there, the unassigned address is in there, and all of those wouldn't be valid coming in on a public internet uh, interface. Outbound spoofing mitigation, yeah, we could do things like Alrighty, well, I'm not going to let people on the inside with their private use only IP address space go outside onto the internet. So we have the comment here from Cisco, pretty funny. Be a good network citizen and prevent your network from participating in these accidental spoofing attacks. I'm sure it's an accident. I'm sure no one in your network would try and communicate on the internet with their private use only address. That would be very rude. That wouldn't happen with our wonderful internal employees. How about filtering ICMP messages inbound? Sure, we can do that. And we can use the graphical user interface to do it, or we can do it at the command line as <coughs> we demonstrated. These ICMP messages could be filtered outbound as well. And then you know what happens a lot of times these days? You want to make sure services you're not using in your organization are not able to be brought in. So if you have banned Telnet 
and you've banned Telnet because you know it is a dangerous, clear text protocol, you can go ahead and ban it, and then you can go ahead and make sure it is truly banned by having ACLs that detect that specific traffic on your network and drop it at key specific points. Well, folks, in this particular lesson, we took a look at access control lists and how they can take our router and make our router a firewall, albeit a simple, simple firewall, but still an effective static packet filtering firewall. Well, what about a more sophisticated firewall? Do we have that ability? We sure do. The most sophisticated firewall that we can build utilizing our Cisco router these days is called a zone-based firewall. With the zone-based firewall, we can take groups of interfaces and we can place these groups of interfaces into what we call zones. We then can control with policy how traffic flows between these particular zones. Wow. So here you can see I create a trusted zone for our internal users. I create a DMZ zone for those devices that we want reachable from the public internet. I create an untrusted zone for the public internet. And then we can go in and we can dictate what the policy will be. For instance, people on the internet can go in and utilize resources in the DMZ, but DMZ's devices cannot initiate connections into the internet. We say that the trusted zone can freely communicate with the internet, but once again, the internet cannot initiate connections into the trusted area. And finally, the trusted area and the DMZ, they can communicate back and forth all they like. Sure, we could do this with standard access, uh, excuse me, extended access control lists, but it would be a nightmare, especially when you consider that we were probably going to start adding interfaces at some point as we grow. This is no problem for the zone-based approach. We can add those interfaces as we gr grow, no problem at all. This is a very scalable, modular type of solution. Not only is it this really cool, scalable, modular solution, but as you can see just above my head, it includes a remarkable amount of additional features. It really does include a remarkable amount of uh, specialized features, the zone-based. It can do things like that stateful inspection that we like so much and talked about. It can do application level inspection, filtering on URLs you don't want your users visiting. We can do transparent firewall with it when we want it, if we want it. So it really is a amazingly robust firewall that we can add to our Cisco router. You see, this is actually the final generation, or at least the generation that we know of right now, of firewall technologies in Cisco systems. At first, we just had those ACLs we looked at. Then Cisco created something called Cisco IOS Firewall, which had formerly been named context-based access control. And then they took this technology and they said, let's make it zone-based for the ultimate in firewalling technologies. 
As one of my students once told me here in class, once you go zone-based, you'll never go back. And that's because of the robustness of this solution and the great features that it brings. Now, when we think about traditional iOS firewall and CBAC, it worked great. It could really work great for you, but it was going to be problematic if you had a lot of interfaces like we described that you wanted to participate in the process. So if you've got a lot of interfaces and you've got a lot of different zones like a DMZ1, a DMZ2, two trusted areas, an untrusted area, well, then this approach of zone-based really starts to shine. It offers a whole new and improved configuration model that I'm going to teach you that is really, really the best. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and take a break now that I've introduced the zone-based firewall to you. And in our next session, we're going to go ahead and examine the ins and outs of this exciting latest generation of firewall technologies for our routers from Cisco Systems.